Thank you very much, and a special thanks to Vitor and to organizers of this seminar for the invitation to be here. And I thought that uh, given the topic of this uh, seminar on, in, on circulation of economic ideas and uh, is national issues uh, of economic thought, it, will, it would be particularly uh, appropriate to talk about the uh, translations of economic ideas, and this is the, the, the title that I'm suggesting here to, to, to address with you. And the questions, I'm not sure I'm going to respond to these questions, but these are the underlying problems that I'm trying to address, uh, not only in this paper, but on, uh, also on other papers that will come uh, afterwards, and uh, on research that is still in, 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 in progress, is uh, what is lost and found in the translation of economic te texts, what are the main features of the adaptation and the appropriation of economic ideas through translation, and what is the relevance of these processes uh, to understand the appropriation of economic thought in different national contexts. So this is the, the broader topic of the conference, and, and I'm sure that m many of the, the, the things that I have to say in the first part of the paper have already been said by Vitor in his presentation, so I will skip a lot of what I have to say because there is a lot, uh, uh, of course, that is related to this uh, accumulated wisdom on the relevance of this uh, topic, uh, the international mobility and diffusion of economic ideas, since at least the, 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 the 50s with these papers organized by the, uh, the special I I issues, a special supplement or issue or section uh, on, on um, international diffusion of economic thought uh, uh, in the American Economic Association uh, uh, Journal. And so th there is, uh, uh, since the, the, then, uh, a lot of uh, 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 research that has been done. The name of Bob Coates has also been uh, 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 mentioned here, um, uh, uh, who is, of course, a very important uh, figure in uh, putting forward projects in this area. And so I will skip most of the references uh, which I believe show uh, this concern with not only the production of economic ideas, but also the conditions that may uh, accelerate or may uh, hinder uh, the process of uh, governing the transmission and diffusion of ideas in different contexts, and uh, uh, especially uh, discussing the constraints that we, we can find uh, uh, when uh, societies and economies have different levels of development and uh, uh, greater or lesser uh, uh, degrees of cultural and political cosmopolitanism, and so there is a lot, uh, uh, immense literature on these topics, and I will simply s uh, skip it. But not with, uh, uh, without uh, mentioning uh, uh, our, our colleague uh, uh, Antonio Almodova has already been uh, mentioned by Nuno this afternoon. And I, I would like just to uh, um, refer and mention Antonio uh, once again because uh, he was in a certain way pioneering most of our reflections on this topic, at least as far as uh, Portuguese uh, 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 scholarship on this topic is concerned. Uh, in uh, uh, one of his introductions to uh, the, collective, co the, the collected works of uh, José Acúcio das Neves, as you may remember, Antonio, together with uh, Armando Castro, have uh, edited a six-volume set of the works of uh, a Portuguese economist of the uh, uh, early 19th century, Acúcio das Neves, and in one of his introductions, uh, uh, um, he um, uh, discussed uh, the, uh, how he, he called it the penetration of political economy in Portugal through the writings of this uh, uh, Portuguese economist. And the main point of Antonio's was, was to show that the relevance and the quality of the writings of uh, uh, Neves could not be properly assessed by means of a comparative approach with the British and French authors usually considered as canonical models uh, of uh, or representative patterns of classical political economy, let's say uh, Smith, Malthus, Jean-Baptiste C, Ricardo. And so Antonio's main point was that uh, we, we, we sh if you want, we want to, to, to understand what is the penetration of political economy in Portugal in this period, we should not compare the Portuguese authors with the, the British or the French at the time. Uh, and why? It was not possible because we, we cannot use the, the same thought structure and concepts no, not even the same technology applied to production in a country that was reluctant to the acceptance of major economic innovation. So there was uh, uh, what, uh, uh, and I, I will summarize Antonio's point by quoting him, and he says that the transfer, and I quote, the transfer of, of knowledge and technology requires a certain 
the word in Portuguese is uh, acclimatação. Uh, I, I would say in English, uh, climatization. Acclimatization. Uh, so a process of acclimatization, or in equivalent terms, says Antonio, a set of previous cultural changes. So another point important but that is stressed by Antonio is to explain uh, what this acclimatization process is about and is the need of creating appropriate institutional conditions uh, and material conditions to implement the development of economic concepts used by foreign authors who are taken as authority references and ultimately to make political economy reasonably and commonly understood. So there is no question about saying that Neves was a classical political economist or, or was not a classical political economist. What was important for Antonio was to understand the processes of, uh, of cultural change and also of economic development in different countries and so that we can understand this acclimatization of ideas and this transfer of ideas. And I suppose that in doing this uh, 30, 32 years ago, Antonio was in a certain sense uh, anticipating the debates that we are having here today when we discuss these issues on, uh, national, uh, uh, on, on the national development of economic thought. Apart from this contribution by Antonio, uh, uh, also uh, uh, Vitor has called the attention on uh, certain types of uh, history and social studies of science that have, that have given uh, recently uh, emphasis on these topics of place and the topics of travel. And uh, the role, the, the relevance, just, to, to, just uh, to, to highlight the role and relevance of local and the institutional milieu to understand the process of acclimatization, as Antonio would put it, or the process of transfer in, in the dissemination of economic uh, ideas. So basically, science is locally shaped, and its impact and domain of application also have a local dimension. By giving new focus to the points of reception, and to historical and institutional circumstances explaining the motives for both the adoption and the adaptation of economic ideas and practices, we emphasize the relevance of the institutional milieu in order to explain the conditions under which new forms of economic knowledge have emerged and developed well suited to particular places and contexts of appropriation. It is therefore worth addressing the historical conditions that make the reading of certain authors or certain economic arguments useful and relevant in a given context. And so I'm, re in a certain sense, repeating uh, points that have already been discussed in, uh, uh, with the presentation of Victor this morning. These, these are problems are uh, uh, not, not only an issue, an issue of uh, efficiency, control, and power, as Victor also put it, but also pro an issue of trust and appropriation of uh, scientific knowledge uh, in the public domain. And so uh, 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 we, we, we therefore uh, should take very seriously into account contributions that are coming from not only from uh, science studies uh, the community of scholars, but also from cultural studies uh, who have developed a concern, uh, for instance, in literary studies, uh, developed the concept of uh, adaptation, uh, which we can also use uh, uh, for the adaptation of economic ideas. And so there is, uh, in recent research, uh, 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 I believe, uh, a new uh, uh, way of looking at this process of uh, adaptations, uh, which introduce elements of uh, creative uh, thinking, uh, diversity, the variation that offer new insights of the study of the process of transmission and diffusion, including those pertaining to the circulation of economic ideas. There is no longer a concern with remaining faithful to the original source or studying influences within a static framework, but instead with the appropriation of works and arguments that gain a new meaning. And it is precisely here that translations play a very important role. In a certain sense, translations are not only a process of uh, adaptation, but also of appropriation of knowledge, and as I will try to argue, especially in the 18th century, where there is a certain liberty of using the texts in order to appropriate them as they were appropriate for the special uh, uh, economic and social conditions of the country where uh, this process of appropriation takes place. So one of the instruments placed at the service of the strategies of appropriation is the translation into the national language of texts and books produced in a different national and linguistic setting. Translation thus reveals a heuristic capacity applied to the study of the routines of knowledge, 
of knowledge adaptation and knowledge appropriation, which may be conceived as elements of a wider process of cultural transfer and cultural exchange. And to use uh, uh, Antonio's words, a process of acclimatization. So the translations are, in a certain way, a, a, a very useful uh, instrument to understand this process of uh, adaptation and appropriation. Uh, given uh, uh, the topic that I will, in the examples that I will give, I believe it is particularly appropriate to discuss this issue in a, a, a precise historical context, which is the context of the Enlightenment. And uh, it is uh, clear that in late 18th century, uh, Roger in his presentation referred as the first example of this cosmopolitanism, uh, late 18th century, and it is clear that it is precisely during this period that uh, uh, there was an explosion of translation in economic literature, and uh, 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 not only of economic literature, but in most European countries by mid 18th century, translations into Latin were no longer needed for international readership. The Latin uh, lost its role in scholarly writing as well as in fiction and poetry. And in the late 18th century and, and early 19th century, sorry, there was no legal control of uh, the contents of translations. In a very nice paper published in Hope in 2010, Evelyn Forger has explained precisely this idea of, uh, that there were no assignments of copyright. Translators could take liberties with style and argument without respecting the original message of the, of, of, of the text. Substantial differences could therefore be found whenever translators acknowledged the disclaimer of a free translation or a paraphrase, uh, which means that uh, translating translators uh, trad traditor traditori are also traditory and they are adapting the text according to what they want to mean with, with this process. And so, uh, even if when they claim they, tra they try to remain faithful to the author that is translated, there was no rule about how to make a translation. And uh, since there were no copyright rights at the, mo at, at, at the time, this created the possibility of this diffusion in which ideas, some ideas are lost and some ideas are found. And so, so, you, so you lost the meaning of some part of the text, but you, you, you try to, found, to find other uh, meanings for the text that you are translating. So original texts are transformed in order either to attract readers or to create an audience better prepared to be aware of the contents of the message translated. However, by introducing notes and amendments to the texts, translators produce changes of meaning to the original for the benefit of new audiences for whom the transformed message seems to be, <coughs> sorry, the transformed message seems to fit much better. So this was particularly true for the translations in political economy. And political economy was one of the main subjects contributing to the enlargement of this market of translations in, in, at the end of the 18th century. The appropriation of ideas and the adaptation of analytical or political arguments are also associated with a process of emulation, as we learn uh, through the work of Sophus Reinert, according to which that uh, what has occurred in a country that has reached a certain degree of economic development may serve as a, both a stimulus and a model to be followed by countries seeking to catch up. In this sense, the circulation of ideas is a mimetic process that involves the tracking of basic steps previously experienced in other countries. And so by translating texts, we are translating experiences and we are trying to emulate nations that have reached uh, a greater uh, uh, process of economic development. Through the process of their being appropriated and emulated, economic ideas are also subject to innovative adaptation and or distortion. The way in which authors are quoted, the transcription of partial excepts, uh, excepts taken out of their textual uh, context, the, trans uh, the translation of widely influential books are all a selective process of circulation and diffusion that may imply substantial change to the original meaning of economic texts, as well as to the presentation of economic arguments. Let me give you an example. Uh, uh, Monica Lupetti and Marco Guidi have done an excellent work uh, 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 explaining uh, with one of the, por uh, the Portuguese translations of uh, Fort Bonnet, uh, uh, Element du Commerce, how the, this, trans this translation was, was made. 
and the parts that have been cut, the parts that have been suppressed, those that have been changed, and how this uh, uh, paraphrasic uh, translation means an adaptation of the text in order to adapt it to the political conditions for which it was, uh, it was produced under a Pombal uh, uh, political regime. So it is clear, very clear that the process of translation is a process of uh, empowering the, poli the, poli the political power uh, at the moment for uh, giving arguments and giving a rationale for uh, the development of certain economic policies as uh, is very well illustrated by the study that uh, Marco and Monique have done for, for this Portuguese translation of Fort Bonnet. So my uh, uh, point, and I move now to these translations uh, from and into Portuguese, uh, I will uh, let part of the arguments to Monique and, uh, and, uh, and Marco because I'm sure they will cover a part of this. And this is precisely what, uh, what I've, I've, uh, I will skip and I will move to my uh, 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 most relevant examples, uh, so I think. But I, I would like to call your attention for, for uh, there are only two translations into English of Portuguese texts in uh, uh, late 18th century, uh, early 19th century. One is Azredo Coutinho, and look at the, the translator's preface uh, uh, to Coutinho, uh, who wrote a book on the commerce of Portugal and Brazil. And this shows, from the point of view of the English translator, the relevance of, of translating Coutinho written in Portuguese into English. And he says, at the present crisis, and this was before the Napoleonic Wars, and this was before the opening of the Brazilian ports, this is in 81, and th th these events are only in 88, at the present crisis, when it may become a measure of policy and experience for Great Britain to take under a protection the colonial possessions of Portugal, this means Brazil, an overpowered but faithful ally, every information that relates to these colonies must be highly valuable to the British administration. So the, 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 the translation of Coutinho is being uh, an instrument for the, 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 the English administration to take over the Portuguese uh, trade uh, in Brazil. Another Portuguese uh, translation of Portuguese author, in, which is quite curious, but I, I will not develop it too much, is Pinheiro Ferreira, who, uh, this is a very curious case, he translated uh, McCulloch, John McCulloch, uh, into uh, uh, Portuguese. Then uh, this uh, McCulloch was also translated into uh, French. Uh, and, at the, and after uh, a kind of abrégé or summary uh, mm -hmm. version of McCulloch's uh, uh, principles of political economy w was uh, retranslated into English uh, uh, for the purpose of teaching uh, uh, in a private French school uh, in Paris. Uh, so look at, at, at the so we have McCulloch in English uh, done through a process of uh, a double translation, first to Portuguese and French, and then again to English. I think that this is a very interesting case. No one have, has ever checked to see what McCulloch comes into English after being translated into Portuguese and then in English. But you see, you see how this uh, translation process is really something that means adaptation, appropriation, and uh, is a totally different product. So because it responds to particular to particular uh, uh, um, uh, motivations. I'll talk to you about. Uh, when we talk about uh, translations of economic texts, normally we do not consider, and if you look, for instance, at, uh, and it is worth seeing this, the list of that Kenneth Carpenter, who was a librarian, who was a librarian of um, um, uh, uh, Crest Library at Harvard during many time, and he has, a, uh, he has a, a, an open data, uh, an open source that is open at, at Harvard, uh, uh, open access uh, uh, resources, where he lists uh, translations uh, uh, of books uh, into English from different languages. And is, the project is just to cover all the translations of economic literature up to 1850. And normally, in these books and pamphlets, there, are, there is no consideration of technical books and pamphlets that are written, uh, especially in the context of the Enlightenment, in order to increase the instruction for the amelioration and for the betterment of uh, agriculture, uh, manufacture, etc. So this uh, kind of literature is not considered. And I believe that it is particularly interesting to, to take it into account because uh, uh, in uh, uh, late 18th century Portugal, due to the role of this minister, Rodrigo Sousa Coutinho. Uh, he created, I mean, I will not go into details, but he had a very important 
um, uh, uh, role in uh, challenging the traditional mercantilist approach to the colonial pact. So it's a kind of uh, moving from uh, an extra, uh, considering uh, uh, Brazil as a source of uh, revenue and a source of taxes, but uh, moving f to a different uh, attitude, considering Bra that, that Brazil would uh, much better uh, 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 fulfill uh, the, the objectives of the Portuguese crown if there was economic development, agricultural development, and manufacturing development in Brazil. And so it tries to, to modernize the, the, the economic structure in Brazil, also the taxation structure, and he tries to provide incentives for agriculture and trade activities in Brazil. And also he tries to improve knowledge and scientific knowledge and useful knowledge at, for the, at the service of uh, economic development. And in this context, not only the, the, the geographic society that he creates, but this, this Casa Literaria, this is a printing house uh, that he created with, uh, the, with the support of uh, many uh, Brazilians uh, uh, who lived in, Port in, in continental Por uh, uh, in, in European Portugal at the time, and uh, 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 in which he tried to uh, con convey the idea of a useful science, of a practical knowledge that is used for economic improvements. And uh, uh, there is no doubt that this was only possible due to his uh, uh, personal engagement in creating this printing house. Um, it is interesting that Coutinho uh, served, before being minister, he served in Turin uh, as uh, uh, ambassador of the Portuguese uh, uh, court. And uh, he, 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 he has built a library which is quite impressive. His library, for instance, let, let me give you uh, an example. I have a paper that will come out soon on this library because it had it never been studied. The economic uh, uh, contents of his library is impressive. He had, for instance, four editions of the, the Wealth of Nations the second and the third edition uh, in English, and the, the two French translations of the Wealth of Nations. But he has, he has all the, economic, the relevant economic literature of the time. And also many books on technical issues, which are precisely the books that are going to, some of them that are going to be translated into Portuguese uh, with this uh, enterprise of the Casa Literaria of Artus Seng. So there was a network of engravers, uh, of printers and translators, uh, 61 employees at the time, uh, including 21 engravers. And uh, 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 what, what we see at the, these books and booklets uh, on scientific subjects, such as uh, agronomy, I'm reading because I'm, I see that I'm re uh, running out of time, such as agronomy, botany, chemistry, mineralogy, applied to the better use and more efficient economic allocation of natural resources in Brazil, but also on social issues related to poverty, beggary, and public health. They provided evidence on practical concerns with economic improvements in agriculture, cattle raising, manufacturing, and commerce, com commercial circuits. Uh, many of them consisted of hands-on instructions aimed at making feasible new optimal ways of resource allocation. The aim and scope of some of the books uh, and pamphlets was to simply provide information uh, presented in a technical way on the botanic description of plants or the mineralogical constitution of soils or the properties of certain plants for industrial use or particular instruments to improve transport and storage while other works were conceived as a systematic presentation of a general framework of technical and social relationships in the various sectors of economic activity. The printing house, the Casa Literaria, turned out to be an efficient network of Brazilian students and officials temporarily living on the continent, but who con continues to play uh, close attention to the uh, immense potential uh, of Brazilian resources. An informal system of scholarships was in place, which allowed for the payment of translations, with Coutinho masterfully managing this educated uh, network. The motto of this joint, of this venture, uh, uh, made perfect sense. And the, the motto was, without books, there is no instruction. And so there are books and instructions for improving and for the betterment of uh, the, uh, 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 the use of economic resources. There are many issues that can be discussed here. One of them is uh, the relationship between nature and power, and see how 
the, the plant of the sugar, the canna uh, of sugar, it embraces the, the arms of the Portuguese crown in this, uh, 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 giving us uh, 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 precisely this idea of uh, the empowerment of nature and how we, we conceive nature in, with, a, with the sense of uh, commanding it uh, through power. And most of the books, I'll just show you some of the parts, are, are full of very nice engravings. This is the production of sugar, uh, from which I'm not going into details. You can see the organization of labor, the different uh, uh, social classes that are present, include, including slaves uh, that are working here. For instance, with very nice uh, uh, paint, this is one of the, the, the plants that is used for uh, coloring textiles. So this is the description of uh, indigo uh, in a sense that, uh, so, so for not only for, for the medical and the pharmaceutical uses and also for industrial uses. So these, these are books on botanics, but they are ma ma mainly presented and prepared for to show the relevance of uh, knowing uh, uh, botanic and mineralogy uh, in order to improve the, the quality of the, the, the use of economic of, of resources. These are uh, other examples of the, 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 the illustrations. As I told you, there were 21 engravers working in this uh, uh, Casa Literario, which uh, worked during four years, between 1796 and 1801. So what we have here is a total of uh, uh, and, I, I, and I put it, uh, the Arco do Cego, with other publishers that are, were connected with Arco do Cego at the time. We have a total of, of 140 books, some s with 63 originals and 77 translations. And all these are these technical translations on, on uh, 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 agriculture industry and some of them on social issues such as public health. And uh, the, uh, the, we have, you have here a distribution of, of, of the topics and, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the presence of, of topics on trade and communication, social problems, arts and manufacturers, and especially uh, agriculture, uh, show the relevance of the, the printing house in order to improve the, the, the use of economic resources in uh, Brazil. There were translations from uh, of books on agriculture. I will not. I, I will skip these examples. But one of the issues that is relevant is, is although there is not a theoretical framework. Some of the translators revealed awareness of a global contextualization provided by political economy discourse. The opportunity for a more erudite approach could be created by the fact that the text translated was itself a vehicle of well-known authors, as was the case of, uh, with a short pamphlet on the, on the cultivation of potatoes, is this one, this pam pamphlet, in which the author co quotes Adam Smith in defense of the lower labor intensity of potatoes fields when compared with rice and wheat. Uh, however, we may also find a more articulated view on the concatenation of economic activities as presented by the translators in the justification prologues uh, regarding, for instance, the need to build navigation channels to reduce transport costs and the price of goods. So there are, even if they are not economic texts or theoretical uh, um, uh, manuals, of course, but they have uh, economic concerns and they try to uh, uh, explain why this translation is taking place and why we should care about what is being uh, diffused. I will, I'm about to conclude. Uh, by the end of the 18th century, scientific knowledge, especially in natural history and medicine, is part and parcel of a broader set of economic and political interests. Policies designed to foster economic development in colonial territories were determined by the capacity and willingness of the men of science to engage in botanic description and pharmacy laboratory experiments, knowing that their contributions were paramount to that end, while being also an instrument to better controlling both the natural world and the social order. Botanic illustrations with different degrees of adequacy to the real natural world were an indispensable tool to approach and take over the same natural world. The process of appropriation of nature by man implied a cooperation and institutional network in which politicians, reformers, and scientists alike, an enlightened elite, converged to the very same objective, a better science to serve a better society, within the limits of the imperial network, within the limits of the existing power at the time. The promotion of this impressive and almost aggressive translating and publishing activities of the Casa Literaria do Arco Cego 
outside the usual university and academic milieu, so this is outside the Portuguese Academy of Sciences and outside the University of Coimbra, so this uh, network, uh, this institution, this institution of power and network uh, 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 that was uh, represented by the Casa Arto Cego uh, was an instrument to promote useful knowledge applied to the development of economic activities in Brazil, especially those associated to the better use of natural resources. And it is my point that these translations are therefore an instrument of uh, diffusion, dissemination of knowledge, but also of appropriation of knowledge with a clear political message and with a clear uh, political purpose. Uh, this is not, uh, th these are not uh, theoretical tracts, these are not uh, uh, tracts on political economy, of course not, but they are uh, practical rules, practical instruments that show the relevance of, in this case, translations to uh, 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 disseminate and uh, provide a better uh, diffusion of economic uh, and technical knowledge. Thank you.